be. I want to be standing there and blocking this too. <coughs> All right. <coughs> okay. Good evening, and thanks for coming again. Uh, so my, the title of my talk is about ecology and conservation of tropical butterflies. But I, I want to start with this slide uh, and some of. Okay, you're here. You're here. And uh, really, just to say that those of you who haven't got this T-shirt, please go get it, <laughs> <laughs> including myself. Okay. Uh, Amy, Amy, and KC have put in a lot of effort to really make this t-shirt, so thank you very much. <laughs> Can we have a round of applause? Okay. Alright, so the way I usually uh, approach this topic is to start off with a very broad picture, what is really happening in the tropics, okay. and then narrow down into where we are, the different types of habitats we are left with, and what is going on in different in each of these habitats? Okay. So no need to read the words. Uh, just the title. Okay. Southeast Asian biodiversity is in crisis. Okay. This was uh, a paper in 2004 from NUS, and situations have only gotten worse. Uh, we are in the center of a, of many global uh, biodiversity hotspots and. We have been losing a lot of species, and uh, some of the countries around us, Indonesia, Malaysia, have the highest rates of deforestation in the world. Okay. So whatever we do uh, is uh, whatever is happening in the region uh, is actually quite important, uh, and. Singapore was uh, is no exception in terms of uh, land use change. We started off like this; it was all forest, and uh, a lot of Singapore is now like this. And in between, we have made efforts to become uh, somewhat green. So we have created la different landscapes from parks and gardens, uh, and we are really uh, approaching. Is Singapore a, a blueprint for uh, Southeast Asia in the future? Okay. So, the landscape in Singapore is changing. In 1890s, we started off with all green, and obviously, uh, over the years, we have lost a lot. Uh, we only left with 2% of uh, primary forest and old secondary forest, and about 25% of uh, young forest. 30% of managed vegetation and so on. But really, if you see just these central portions are mature forests and everything else is young and secondary. So in this landscape, whatever we have left uh, is crucial. However, uh, flagship species often uh, get most attention. We are all familiar with the hornbills, pangolins and the banderly monkeys. So, a lot of these uh, flagship species often capture attention, uh, funding as well as public interest. But really, who who runs the world? It's the little things that run the world. Right? Um, e. O. Wilson published this very famous paper in 1987, and he talked about ants that really run the world. If you think in terms of ecosystem function, uh, if you think in terms of the biomass they provide to other animals, they are really, really crucial. So obviously, uh, for insects, we have to create flagships, and that's why we, we had things like uh, vote for the national butterfly. You all obviously uh, are very familiar with the results. <coughs> so while we have these flagships, those present an opportunity for conservation, whatever we are left with. 
So fortunately, we still have a lot of uh, help. <coughs> there is an active butterfly group, there are many active butterfly photographers uh, and uh, enthusiasts. They, they take uh, a lot of good pictures and have put together many field guides and books. Uh, my field guide by Mr. Q, really good. Uh, this was produced by NSS uh, several years ago and uh, some of you may already be using the uh, butterfly app that is available for the iPhone. <coughs> so if you have any species uh, identification issues, you can always go there. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus more about the science of, con of butterfly conservation. And uh, some of it is derived from uh, my research. So do pardon me if it becomes a little scientific, um, but I will try to keep it relatively straightforward. So, tropical butterflies are largely affected by uh, by five different things. Uh, <coughs> habitat quality, uh, host plant as a resource, nectar and, and non-nectar resource, predation pressures, and finally uh, dispersal. So, I'm going to tackle each of these five things in five different uh, sections. So first, about butterfly extinctions and uh, what is really going on in terms of extinctions and discoveries uh, in Singapore. <coughs> so uh, there are many rediscovered species. Uh, every now and then you will see uh, species are back from the brink, uh, and the, but this is largely for mammals. For butterflies, uh, there are very few long-term data, data sets. There is one from uh, Panama, uh, from NBC, uh, Barrow, Colorado Island, where they monitored butterflies for over 100 years. But those data sets are really rare. What we have attempted to do in Singapore is something similar. Look at historic and current uh, trends in extinctions and discoveries. So. For the purposes of this presentation, historic refers to anything that was before 1990, and uh, current is it, whatever was after 1990. Okay. And then uh, we look at how it relates to land use change, and also how, does, how do these extinctions and discoveries compare with birds. So this, for this, I obviously had to look through uh, a lot of literature, uh, since the time Wallace started publishing, over the years, uh, we have many books and publications. And really, uh, classify, for this study, I classified butterflies as extinct if they were not cited for the past 25 years. And some of these species, although they've been, uh, they've not been cited for 10 years or so, we, we classified them as possibly extinct. So there are two classes, extinct and possibly extinct species. So after we did all the number crunching, looking at the literature, this is what we found. 476 species have been recorded from Singapore to date. That's pretty incredible, right? Only 700 square kilometers of area. And what, originally even less than that. Uh, of which only 331 are left surviving. 145 extinctions. Nine possible extinctions since 1997. And I say possible because these species haven't been cited for the last 10 years. Uh, so they may be extinct, they may not be extinct. But there is a high chance. 34 new discoveries uh, since 1997. And 61 rediscoveries. And I will talk more about rediscoveries and the new discoveries uh, in a second. So, for possibly extinct species, uh, this is a, this is an example: red-based Isabel, which is uh, now very likely extinct. And this is just to show the gradient in which. Uh, the darker colors are mature forest and as we go along 
species are found in many different habitats. And what you see here is the possibly extinct species uh, are restricted to really mature forests. And as we saw before, mature forests, we only left with nearly 2% of mature forests. So that is where all these species are clustered. And if we were to lose more mature forests, we know the answer, right? We are likely going to lose these things even more. Rediscovered species, on the other hand, <coughs> when species that were cryptic, something like these, that were dull and confusing with other species, which we often tend to overlook. And most of them also actually utilize forests, which makes sense because they are cryptic as well as forests. So we are, there's a chance that we may have overlooked them, and hence the rediscovery. But new discoveries have actually been largely from urban parks. And uh, a lot of these species were either <coughs> vagrants, only one sighting, so we don't really know whether that species uh, is, is a resident, could just be coming and going, or some of them are even non-natives. Much fewer are cryptic. And that gets us thinking, uh, a lot of species are actually using urban parks, and species, some species may be more adaptable than we actually think they are. So urban park uh, has a value. Okay. Again, not don't need to read the numbers, but just the middle column. Uh, over the years, from 1956 to now, the extinctions have kept increasing. Uh, and the total number of extant butterflies, what we know, has changed over time, which you can see better from here. Over the years, uh, our knowledge has kept on increasing. Uh, in the past, uh, 1950s, we only knew from 390 species, uh, but today we know 475, and that is obviously a result of discoveries. Um, so again, this the number of species is a changing dynamic, uh, and extinctions have actually shot up uh, until 1990, and then we've seen a slowdown. And the best way to understand this uh, is by looking at land use change. So in the 1920s, which is where uh, our first extinction records start, we nearly had 85% of forest. But in 1990, this forest had been reduced to about 50%, including mature forests degraded forests, uh, woodlands, and so on. And that obviously changed the urban area a lot. So over these years, as we lost so much forest, our extinctions really peaked. From 30 over extinctions, we had nearly 145 extinctions. But look, what has happened uh, since we have better park connectors, our habitat has largely stayed intact. And so, the extinctions have actually slowed down. We do not have, if you look at the slopes here versus there, we are not seeing, we are seeing extinctions at a much slower rate, if any. So to summarize, uh, there is a slowdown in extinctions and that is largely because of habitat recovery possibly improve connectivity, higher observer effort, more of us are actually looking out these days. <coughs> and uh, could be something what what is called an extinction debt, whereby a species habitat may be lost today, but it goes extinct much later. Lena is thinking, I can explain that to you later. <laughs> And uh, what it definitely tells us is the importance of long-term monitoring. <coughs> these are data sets collected over more than a, 
since 1920s to now and only when we've collected something for that long do we know uh, what are the dis rediscoveries, what are the new species discoveries and so on. So if somebody ever tells you that, oh, we know everything about butterflies uh, and we don't need to monitor anymore, uh, well, please tell them about this. We are discovering things every year and the dynamic is changing. All right, moving on. Uh, so which species, which habitats? So rare species often tend to be in, uh, in restricted uh, habitats and they do poorly in degraded landscapes. <coughs> and so we wanted to find out how are these, sorry, how are these rare species impacted by change in landscapes and by the habitat size. So here I actually looked at many different uh, locations and they were in different habitat types as well, mature forests, degraded forests, urban parks, uh, and so on. 20 year data set uh, from 94 when Stephen Mew actually started uh, his observations to until recently. And uh, this was an effort of uh, Transact Box, largely 1 to 2 kilometers in length, 281 species, many different sites. And broadly, these were the results that common species are found everywhere you know, in different habitat types. Uh, interestingly, uh, you will see nearly the same number of common species in urban parks and uh, in the forest. Right? But rare species is a completely different matrix. Uh, rare and species that are only in few habitats, they get 50% hit in degraded forests and they are only found about 10% in urban areas. And also lysinids and hesperids are impacted the most. So then we did some models which I'm not going to show you. But what we found uh, was that Again, rare species are impacted the most. Mature forests are key. Uh, and forest fragments actually have some species that are found nowhere else. So forest fragments actually are very, very important. Because if we lose those forest fragments, uh, like forest in Kula Ubi, or Mount Faber Park, or say in the Western Catchment, Tenga Forest, and so on, we they are irreplaceable because then we lose species that are found nowhere else. All right. Okay. So, moving on. Flower specialization. Now, uh, a lot of us think about butterflies as uh, host specialized, right? like lime butterfly uh, eats only on the or largely only on the lime plants. Uh, likewise, Aristo common rose, which only feeds on Aristolochia. But for flowers, we tend not to think about specialization. We think, oh, just about any flowers would do. So the main question here was, are tropical butterflies, and butterflies in Singapore, are they specialists or are they generalists in terms of uh, nectar feeding? And we all know that nectar is really important. It affects uh, longevity, fecundity, how frequently they reproduce, and so on. And it has clear implications for management. Uh, so the objectives here were to find out specialization and why. Are there any specific things that make them specialized? Uh, and are there any preferences uh, with regards to feeding? And if there are, is it different between native flowers versus uh, non-natives? So here, uh, again, this was a very exhaustive study uh, across uh, different sites and across uh, different plant forms from trees all the way down to uh, shrubs and herbs. Okay. And again, without going into the science, we fitted several uh, of these graphs. Uh, so anything that so on the x-axis are the different uh, number of flower visits, on the y-axis and 
how many species are a butterfly feeding on. And what anything that fits on this line is really uh, an intermediate. Anything above is a generalist, anything below is a specialist. And what do I mean by that? Okay. Common Mormon, which many of you are familiar with, feeds on many, many different flower species. Okay. So it is actually a generalist. Well, so the tree yellow, which is more selective and only feeds on a very few flowers, so it's a specialist. What we also found uh, were the li that lysinids, in particular, were uh, specialized, and they also have a high extinction risk in the tropics. So, if they are, they already have a high extinction risk, and they are also flower specialized. So, if we don't pay any attention. Uh, to that, then we are very likely to uh, lose lysinids more than others. Which traits may be most associated? Again, uh, several num number, number crunching. Uh, and here I have to calculate several things, uh, like proboscis lens of butterflies. Some of you who joined me and Simon in the field, uh, we actually measured uh, proboscis lens of, but of butterflies and coil the proboscis, really stick, stick it out with the needle. Uh, don't worry, it's not painful. <laughs> as long as you do it with care, and uh, measure it, and then the proboscis coils back. Uh, and then measuring things like wingspan, and mobility, how frequent, how good of a flyer they are, things like that. So, uh, do feeding preferences uh, change with habitat type? Uh, I will skip this. Uh, native versus non-natives. Uh, butterflies actually feed almost equally uh, on natives as well as non-natives in our forests. Which might come as a surprise uh, to some people, but if you walk in our forests, uh, there are a lot of non-natives. and uh, they actually flower more frequently than uh, the natives. Uh, however, the specialists still prefer native flowers, like uh, this tree yellow, which actually, some of you may have seen this butterfly almost exclusively feeding on Lyra indica. Uh, so, at least in my observations, more than 70% of the time, they were just feeding on a single flower species. So here uh, we established that there are definitely more flower specialists, uh, more flower generalists than specialists. And specialists actually prefer native flowers, which get, gets us to a point about non-natives. We often talk about non-natives being bad and overcoming uh, natives. Uh, so, the debate here is that yes, if butterflies are visiting the non-natives more uh, than before, then they may be impacting uh, the reproduction of the native flowers because they are visiting them that much more, uh, that much less. But on the other hand, if uh, there were no non-natives, uh, then what would the butterflies feed on? So the non-natives in that sense are actually extending the flowering season, uh, at least in fragmented landscapes. So non-natives definitely have benefits as well as uh, some costs. Okay. So here we're looking at this puzzle. How far are butterflies feeding? Uh, Lena joined me in some of these trips and uh, you will recall this photo. Uh, this is a, both of you that they can look at Dina. So some of you may know that a lot of dispersal research is limited to fruit baits. Where people put out these bait traps and then they put uh, fermented fruit, bananas, uh, rotting, uh, rotting things. And then the fruit feeding butterflies, uh, largely nymphalids, they come and 
they, they get attracted to these baits, get trapped, and uh, that's how people, then people mark them. Uh, and when they're found in other traps, then they can tell how far they've flown. So that is a usual way of uh, doing research uh, on tropical butterflies. Uh, but that is obviously limited to only fruit feeding butterflies. Here, uh, what we want to establish is a broad uh, understanding of dispersal. And we also know that actually lands the matrix, meaning what type of habitat a butterfly is in, plays a key role uh, in dispersal. Uh, so here, uh, I established six different plots. Uh, those that are in darker color are forest plots, and those in the light. The white background is, are actually urban plots. B standing for Bukistima, uh, N for Nisun, and M for Mekrichi. The six plots, uh, and we visited them over the, over the course of the study many different times, average uh, four hours uh, per visit. And uh, we really captured a lot of different species, but uh, recaptures were significant only for 17 different species. So we had to go out in the forest uh, with nets, we would capture a butterfly, mark its location using a GPS, uh, write a unique tag on, on the individual using a fine marker pen, and then walk around in the forest specific trails when we see that individual again, actually when, when we see any individual with marking, we first try to look at it from a binocular, if we can read the code, uh, if not then we have to recapture it. Uh, and then take a GPS at the recaptured location again, then go back, do the math, calculate the dispersal distance. So, uh, on an average, we had nearly 10% of recaptures, and this is just to show uh, six different plots, three forests, three urban, and the recapture rates were higher in urban areas uh, versus and lower in the forests. Uh, this is the key point here. Might seem like a lot of things going on, uh, but the top three, uh, the top two frames are for forest. The bottom three are for urban areas. Okay. And here you will see uh, these arrows actually show uh, re marked and recaptured locations. Okay. So here you will see that butterflies are flying randomly from any one point to the other. But in urban areas, what we do see is that butterflies are clustered. And these are just grass patches uh, or very small shrub covers. So they are flying just inside these areas, inside here, inside here, and they seldom cross over. But in forests, they are really flying full swing, so to speak. So, in urban areas, movements were rest seem restricted to grasslands uh, and the managed patches that we saw. And to put that in perspective, uh, in in the forests, butterflies are flying a lot further away and uh, uh, more randomly. But in urban areas, we see the flight patterns are smaller and again restricted. And if you think about it a little more, uh, you will start to figure out that uh, if we have these isolated patches, then we are, uh, the exchange between these patches is going to be limited. And uh, we are going to need corridors if we have to ensure that populations do mix from uh, one urban area to another area in the long term. Okay. So I think I already covered that. Uh, on the, so moving on to the last bit, and this is probably the more, most interesting bit because this is species focused. Uh, so here I looked at the common rose and the common bird wing. Yeah. Rose is my favorite species. Uh, does anyone have bird wing as, a, as their favorite? Carry. <laughs> Two others. Okay. Both of them in Singapore are known to feed only on this host plant, uh, Aristolochia uh, cumulata. And this is a photo from the Singapore Zoo. Uh, 
as you might know that the host plant uh, Aristolochia is this particular species is actually extinct uh, well let me, let me rephrase that the, the native host plant of these two butterflies are extinct in the wild uh, we believe that they used to feed on uh, a plant called Aristolochia jackii which is no longer found the last records were from uh, Jurong Jurong Swamp in the 1930s or so and uh, since then uh, this, this non-native that we are familiar with Dutchman's pipe has been introduced as an ornamental in Singapore it has uh, actually naturalized and uh, it can be found in several locations uh, now including uh, gardens and backyards and sometimes planted uh, for good reasons uh, by in, the, in our parks. So, from that, you would immediately see that because the native host is extinct, uh, these butterflies exclusively, exclusively depend on a planted host plant uh, now. And hence, they are, their success, uh, survival success, is dependent on how we manage these plantings uh, in the long run. So, for here we actually compiled several butterfly sightings all across the island. Uh, actually, con <coughs> say all across. Uh, Rose and birdwing are concentrated in the center, uh, in particular in the southern part of Singapore. Uh, very few sightings from the east. Uh, Ubin, as some of you know, now has regular sightings. The size of the marker here actually shows the abundance. So those that are bigger, uh, like Ubin, NTU, uh, JBG is uh, Jacob Ballas Garden, so Botanic Gardens, uh, around the Sentosa area, Hot Park, uh, Orchard Road. Those are the strongholds of these two, of Burbing and Rose. Uh, on the right, you see the host plant locations and they are really spread around uh, these squares are actually private gardens and you will see a lot of host plants have been planted in the northern part of Singapore many schools around Senkang, Pongol uh, but if you look compare this and this there are almost no sightings here and people often wonder what's going on, why So then I crunched a lot of numbers. Uh, we had uh, over uh, over 4,000 hours of data <coughs> to find out what might be the source populations for uh, the rose and the birdwing. And really, these locations that are marked in solid black uh, look like source populations. Zoo being one, dairy farm, uh, Clementi Woods, Botanic Gardens, JBG is Jacob Ballas and EBO's Evolution Garden. So that general area. <coughs> Istana, and then moving down, Hot Park and India. So immediately, this looks like a corridor. Right? <coughs> and uh, I mark them with solid lines versus dotted lines. Solid lines are within uh, 5 kilometers distance. <coughs> Uh, and the dotted lines are greater than uh, 5 kilometers distance. Now from the literature we know that uh, birdwing can fly up to 5 kilometers. Rose is a weaker flyer, but we don't have any data. My mark recapture study could not get enough rose and birdwing because they, were, they are uncommon in Singapore. So we had to rely on literature. So since they can fly about 5 kilometers, these populations are likely to be connected. Bird wings may be flying in between and hopefully rose too. But really there is no source population here. And I think Istana Park to Ubin uh, is a really long distance. Svetar Country Club, SCC here, where uh, there is now a population. And Kutek Poat as well. Uh, these are still 
<coughs> more than five kilometers. I think Tian, do you do you know the distance? In the range of probably ten kilometers in between these two areas. <coughs> and Obin probably feeds off its population from Malaysia. Uh, in the west, NTU, Jurong Eco Garden area, has a consistent population and which probably interacts with Tengong. So we are really seeing one central cluster, which is kind of stable, but the west, which is isolated, and the east, that is also isolated, at least in the Singapore context, might, might be connected with Malaysia. So three populations now quite distinct from each other. So we don't have a conservation plan for these species as yet. And this, hopefully with this information, we can sit together and figure out how should we connect uh, these two. Uh, should we plant a lot more host plants in between these two locations? So maybe they will gradually expand their populations? Or should we do something else? So to find that out, I actually ran an experiment by planting host plants. And a lot of us plant host plants in our gardens, right? Especially Aristolochia. And we hope that the species come and establish a population uh, in the long term. So I wanted to find out, is planting host plants for this species uh, a right thing to do? And where? Is it good to plant them in a forest or in an urban area? <coughs> So again, we deployed different stations, 14 of them, 16 weeks long. Uh, and here you will see the planting locations. <coughs> this is Bukit Brown. And here is uh, Mekrichi. This is Windsor Park. Some of you were familiar with that. So <coughs> the triangles are host plant plantings in the urban, in, in the forested locations. And the squares are plantings just in the periphery of the forest, in the urban areas. Each of them 100 meters apart, approximately 100 meters apart. So we wanted butterflies within the area uh, to visit the to visit the plant. Like so, there is no difference between visits forest and urban in terms of the landscape. So these are how the host plant plantings look like. To start off, we we had small plants about <coughs> half a meter long, planted in pots, and they grew over time. In urban areas, usually we found eggs uh, in within one or two weeks, and within the fourth week, we had to shut up in oviposition, egg laying. <coughs> But what, when you compare the different habitats, what goes on? This is urban, uh, urban versus forest. And in the y-axis here, you see the number of eggs laid. Okay. So in urban areas, we actually see a lot more eggs being uh, laid, uh, up to a 70, egg, 70 eggs in one uh, cluster, actually. But in forested areas, we have much fewer eggs, sometimes only uh, until 10. So in terms of egg laying, urban areas were much better. Yeah, the butterflies were finding the urban plants a lot easier and utilizing them, which is a good thing, right? Because all of us live in urban habitats, and if you plant the host plants right, uh, then the butterflies are going to come and use them. And uh, this result, so this result was consistent. If you plant the plants in forests, uh, there are fewer eggs laid. And that makes sense because in the forest there are so many more plants, uh, butterflies have a harder time trying to protect them. In urban areas, uh, they can find the plants easily. But if you look at juvenile survival,